Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. My name is Agorastos. I'm Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. And today it is my exceptional honor to be part of this wonderful symposium on biopsychosocial correlates of preventive psychiatry. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the kind invitation to participate here. Today I will be talking about early life stress and cumulative health risk and how early life experiences translate into adult health risk. And if you remember anything about my presentation after uh, some days and months, I suggest it would be this first slide and the picture of an iceberg. Because when talking about early life stress, we talk mostly about the tip of the iceberg, but keep forgetting all the negative consequences that lie beneath the surface and lead to uh, long-term developmental health disparities. I would like to start by citing Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Block said that adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health issue in our societies today. And in my talk, I will try to give you some more data supporting this claim. If we look at the most important causes of health disparity by age, we can separate four different phases. Uh, the phase of prenatal adversities playing a huge role in the development of the fetus. The role of adverse childhood experiences in the age between 0 and 18 years. Adult mental disorders uh, exerting their um, negative outcome on health between the ages of 18 to 50 and the age-related diseases in the age over 50 years. I will try to show you some stats that show us that adverse childhood experiences go hand in hand as well with the adult mental disorders but also with age-related diseases. And this means that adverse childhood experiences may affect our development until we die. There are many definitions on adverse childhood experiences. You probably have uh, heard about early life stress and childhood trauma. Uh, so how do we define adverse childhood experiences? The first two categories refer to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and also physical and emotional neglect. These five categories are typically put together as childhood trauma categories. But also we have different kinds of stressors affecting the children, like mental illness of the parents, uh, violence, uh, substance abuse in the household, and socioeconomic status, and so on. Now, how often are adverse childhood experiences? And unfortunately, the results are devastating. Two out of three children are exposed to trauma and violence during the first 18 years of their lives, almost 67%. While 25%, this is a very stable percentage, have faced only one trauma. But this means that over 40% of our children face two or more adverse childhood experiences during their lives. And these stats are stable during the years and across nations. But it's not just the prevalence overall, which uh, is important, but also the distribution of the prevalence across different society groups. What you can see here is the distribution across income groups where families with very high income have a very low percentage of children exposed to early life uh, stressors, while families with uh, income below the average have a uh, very high range. What you can see here is that pretty much all of the people uh, having exposure to early life stress have this first exposure within the first five years. You can see the percentage of children exposed to 
just one adverse family experience remains pretty much stable. This means that here, the first five years are the years of the first experience. And then, uh, as the children continue with their lives, these experiences add on and reach the final percentage. If you check also the rates uh, in, in minorities, you can see here, this is, this is a, um, a study on US population from the ACE study, probably one of the largest studies worldwide. Here you can see that black population and Hispanic population have higher rates on multiple traumatic events reported by their children. Adverse childhood experiences can have different kinds of impact. They can impact our behavior and they can impact our physical and mental health. And when we think about the behavior, we mean uh, physical activities, smoking, uh, alcohol and drug con consume, or missed work, absence from work. But when we think about physical and mental health, we mean pretty much everything. Obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, depression, stroke, COPD, suicide, STDs, you name it. Pretty much every single disorder and disease uh, can be affected ne negatively by early life experience of stress. And there is a very stable correlation between the number of adverse childhood events experienced by children and the risk of developing health risk over the years. The more exposure people have, the larger the number of adverse childhood experiences they report, the higher the risk of developing physical or mental comorbidity in adult life. In this pattern, you can see in pretty much every single disorder. Here you can uh, see the same pattern in obesity, depression, anxiety, mental illness uh, in general, smoking, alcohol consumption, and drugs where um, children reporting four or more of the adverse childhood events in black here show always the highest rates and then you have like a uh, like a scale here um, from from less to higher risk the same pattern you can uh, see when you check depression and some um, correlates of depression you can see here the childhood trauma score. The higher the trauma score is, the higher the probability of having depression, having uh, mental health com comorbidities, having late response, or having a chronic course of the disease. And it is the same pattern you can also watch when looking at attempted suicide here when looking at the rates of antidepressant prescriptions and very interestingly when you look at other risk factors like the risk of later being raped in, uh, in women. This is, um, this is also suggesting the same pattern. What you see here are probably the most significant first publications linking adverse childhood experiences to the adult risk of heart disease or heart infarction. And what you can see here is the same pattern over and over again, that uh, adults with uh, experience of uh, three uh, childhood traumas show significantly higher rates and risk of developing heart disease. What you can see here is also the same pattern with just one exposure the risk is not significantly higher, but with two or more, you have uh, even uh, double as high rates of heart disease. The same pattern over and over and again. Besides heart disease, you have COPD, you have stroke, kidney disease, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, and even cancer. You can see here that Adults exposed to four or more um, childhood trauma events have the highest rates on cancer development in their adult lives. This is very striking. But not just 
health outcomes, but also uh, functionality outcomes uh, develop the same way and show the same pattern. You can see here that people unable to work out of work more than one year or with a very low income are mostly these people having reported several um, childhood uh, adverse effects in events in their childhood while people reaching retirement or having health care coverage are mostly likely to have zero exposure. And these are just some very striking numbers for you to remember. Here you can see the increase in the risk of disease for uh, adults having reported four or more adverse childhood experiences. So you can see here hepatitis, sexually transmitted diseases, COPD, depression, and look at this number, suicidality. So let's take a very um, small glimpse into the neurobiology of early life stress and how um, this gets translated into adult health risk. Uh, starting by the definition of trauma made by Sigmund Freud, trauma is a stressful experience leading to such an extraordinary stress response that physiological adaptive processing fails leading to long-term dysregulation of biological functioning. So we see that Sigmund Freud was indeed very biological in his thinking. It is the physiological adaptive processing that fails. And this is translated into long-term dysregulation in biological functioning. This is how it works. One way of affecting the central nervous system are developmental structural effects of stress. We know that stress can lead to altered um, uh, neural cell function, but also uh, affect the number of synapses, the number of dendrites, and of course, uh, the volume of the brain. Here you see a very extreme example of extreme neglect and how it differentiates between uh, two, three-year-old children. The way of uh, how these uh, developmental structural changes affect the brain is very much correlated with the certain and specific timing of the stressors. We know that the human brain evolves in the first five years very rapidly, you see here, until the fifth year. And this means that stressors and stress effects from the age of zero to five have different effects on the evolving brain than stressors after this age of five, where the development has reached a plateau. This is supported by evidence um, showing that the risk for depression is much higher than the risk for PTSD in children uh, having faced adverse childhood experiences be, um, between the age of zero and five, while child, childhood experiences after this age lead to a higher risk of PTSD than depression. This is another figure showing how time-dependent effects work. So we have the first phase affecting mostly the hypocampal volume. We have uh, then the later on effects affecting mostly prefrontal, prefrontal cortex areas and gray matter volume. And what are the areas in the brain that are functionally affected, but also structurally affected the most. These are parts of the brain involved in pleasure, reward, emotion, uh, and cognition. Because threat detection, emotional regulation, and reward anticipation are the most important areas um, of, uh, of an impact of early life stress. And parts like amygdala, prefrontal cortex are very, very important for the next coming eight, uh, decades. What you can see here is exactly um, that this connectivity between prefrontal cortex and amygdala, depending on the age of the exposure, can lead to either an emotional undermodulation and, for example, depression or emotional overmodulation, for example, PTSD. <clears throat> and this gets translated into the HPA axis 
as either a state of hyper or hypocortisolemia. However, the end result is the same. We are dealing with glucocorticoid signaling alterations and glucocorticoid signaling um, illnesses. This altered glucocorticoid signaling can lead to a chronic dysregulation of the stress response system, brain development, and also to a broad range of physical and mental comorbidities. You see here pretty much every uh, system related to the stress system is uh, affected the immune system, metabolic, reproductive, cardiovascular, and central nervous system. So early life stress is associated with a broad range of biological findings from HPA axis dysregulation, uh, autonomic imbalance, glucocorticoid signaling, chronic pain, uh, oxidative stress, metabolic complications, immune dysregulation, impaired memory and cognition, and also sleep dysregulation and connectivity dysregulation between prefrontal cortex and amygdala. Very briefly, two words about um, the developmental models. As you can understand, there are, of course, hundreds of models discussed over the years. I would like to present you with uh, one very integrative model, the free hit theory, where we have um, the baseline hit. So we have everything that uh, affects the system before stress exposure, like genetic or epigenetic susceptibility and fetal, fetal programming, uh, gender, previous stress, and pre-existing comorbidities. Everything that happens before early life stress exposure. Then we have hit number two, early life stress, and this depends on number of stressors, intensity, duration, the role of the victim, and the type of the stressor, as well as the exact timing, the developmental stage of the brain, so um, the age of uh, zero to two or five years, leading to a hyper-responsiveness or puberty to a hyper-responsiveness. And of course, the altered glucocorticoid signaling and the HPA axis dysregulation. This dysregulation leads also to an affection of all other allostatic processes like the oxidative stress system, metabolic, sleep, epigenetic programming, transcriptome, immune system, and so on. And then we reach hit number three, everything that happens after trauma. So we're talking about additional stressors, coping style, lifestyle, aging, and social support, all of these can regulate and modulate um, the effects of trauma and either lead to adaptation and resilience or to maladaptation and vulnerability and of course desperate health and developmental outcomes. So this here is the phenotypic plasticity. This is the end result of the three hits taken over the years. And this is the difference between typical and healthy development on the left side and developmental trauma on the right side. Normally, children uh, are not securing survival in everyday life because they're secure. So the regulating mechanisms support social and emotional and, uh, of course, cognitive development in humans. On the other hand, if a child has to deal with surviving all regulatory mechanisms support survival and not really social emotional and cognitive development so we have uh, ups and down pyramid of developmental processing taken together we have the effect of adverse childhood experiences through disrupted neurodevelopment over the years social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, leading to adoption of health, health, uh, health risk behaviors, leading to disease, disability, and social problems, and leading to early death. And indeed, if you look at um, exposed individuals to more than six types of childhood trauma, you can see that there is a possibility of those people leading even up to 
20 years less than controlled circulation without trauma. If you're interested in the topic, I would like to invite you to take a glimpse in our latest publication to, together with Professor Cruzos, Professor Baker, and Professor Pervanido, published last year in the Frontiers of Psychiatry on the developmental trajectories of early life stress and trauma. And finally, we'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much.